Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I have to say, I think this is the very first time I've ever spoken next to a tiger. So, uh, <laughs> But I am here with fairly mixed emotions. Um, on the one hand, very happy to celebrate Aditi and to hear about her work. And on the other, of course, will be very sad that she will be retiring next year. Um, Professor Aditi Lahiri has studied and worked in universities across the globe, and as we all know, is a leading figure in the world of linguistics. Originally, Professor Lahiri took maths at university, but switched to ling linguistics after her undergraduate degree. She followed her parents into academia. They had both studied philosophy at the University of Calcutta. Her mother taught philosophy at Bethlehem College under the University of Calcutta, which was founded in the very same year as Somerville College, Oxford, with which she is currently associated. But unlike Oxford, they allowed women to receive their degrees from the very beginning. Before coming to Oxford in 2007, she thought, taught at the University of Constance in Germany, at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in Niemengen in the Netherlands, and at UCLA. Professor Lahiri has received many honors from across the world, one of the first awards acknowledging her research was the Max Planck Prize for International Cooperation, awarded by the Alexander von Humboldt Association in 1994. She was also awarded the German Leibniz Prize by the German Science Foundation in 2000, the highest award, academic award in that country. She received the Professor Sumakar Sen Memorial Gold Prize in 2009 from the Asiatic Society, the first woman to be awarded this medal. She was appointed a fellow of the British Academy in 2010. She was awarded the Vice Chancellor's Innovation Awards, Inspiring Leadership in 2018, and was appointed Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire in 2020 by Her Majesty the Queen. Arriving in Oxford, Aditi was asked to convert the Committee of the, for Comparative Philology, Linguistics and Phonetics into an independent faculty, which is now flourishing. Linguistic experts in the faculty today include philologists focusing on historical and comparative linguistics, theoretical linguists examining structures of languages, ancient and living phonetics, as well as neurolinguistics. Researchers in Professor Lahiri's Language and Brain Lab, which she established soon after she arrived in Oxford, address questions on how the brain processes language structure, particularly the structure of sounds and how they are put together and of words as they are built up from their parts. And very early in my tenure, Aditi invited me to her lab and enjoyed doing some experiments on me. Um, <laughs> human speech, it turns out, is extremely variable, and no individual can even say their own name twice in an identical fashion. Nevertheless, we understand each other very efficiently, even in our noisy environments. How? Finding an answer involves the study of how language is acquired, how it changes, and how our brains process speech. Her work combines theoretical and experimental approaches to answer questions such as why sound alternations exist between different forms of one and the same word, and how such words are represented in the mental lexicon, how words change over time, and how they are processed in the brain. Recent advances from her team include the development of a cutting-edge flexible speech recognition system, FlexSR, the technology was used to create a mobile phone app to help second language learners improve their pronunciation by analyzing words and sentences spoken into the app and giving specific personal feedback. She has shown me how this works and it's really amazing. She recently became the first Oxford academic ever to be awarded a third European Research Council Advanced Investigator Grant worth 2.5 million pounds. Her grant will examine the principle of pertinacity by studying comparable ph phonological processes internal to individual languages, as well as influences due to borrowing between language across Germanic and Indo-Aryan language families, combining classical historical research with psycholinguistic and neurolinguistic experimentation and computational speech recognition. 
In addition to her academic eminence, Aditi has been a leader and a mentor to generations of academics, including two stints as chair of the Linguistics Faculty Board. I have it on good authority that whenever it's somebody's birthday in the Language and Brain Lab, Aditi provides them with not one but two cakes, one to enjoy there and then and one to take home. Whenever anyone has a problem, health or life or anything else, Aditi reacts instantly by offering to take work off their hands. And however much she's taken on, she's delighted if someone asks her to discuss, to discuss phonology and always finds time. And on top of all that, she has managed to find time to serve on the University Council as an elected trustee of the university. Aditi is affiliated with Somerville College, where she is a valued member of that community and is a, one in a very long line of extraordinarily distinguished women from India, from Cornelia Sabje to Indira Gandhi, and now Aditi Lahiri, to have been affiliated with Somerville. Although she is planning to step down next year, she will not stop her research. As she says, there are so many deep questions about language unanswered and indeed unasked. She is a compassionate and committed colleague, a colleague and I know I will miss working with her. So please join me in welcoming Professor Aditi Lahiri to give her valedictory lecture, Pertinacity of Phenomenological Systems. And I realize before you do that, I think we're going to hear from the faculty board. Is that right? No. I, I was only supposed to think after I'm sure you are. Sorry. In that case, <laughs> in that case, let me repeat. Please join me in welcoming Professor Aditi Lahiri to give her valedictory lecture on pertinacity of phonological systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice <laughs> Chair. see Evan. Am I supposed to turn this on now? I think the Vice Chancellor has said it all. I don't see why I'm saying anything now. Um, this was not supposed to be part of the program. Right, thank you so much for coming. And um, let's see how quickly I get through this. As the Vice Chancellor pointed out, um, many, well, most of you have heard me before, and although not in this guise, um, but Nevertheless, you haven't heard from me for a while, but you can still follow what I'm saying. Nevertheless, adult speech is produced with great speed and accuracy, and words are selected from a mental lexicon of tens of thousands. Um, they are articulated in English at an average rate of three words per second. Now, if this was Turkish or Hungarian, of course, that would be a different matter. Um, for the listener, there are many problems. The environments are noisy, vocal tract sizes vary, and of course, again, as the Vice Chancellor pointed out, sounds of words are not dis discreet. So no word is ever spoken in the same way. Now the colleague who read the following words unfortunately isn't here today, but these are examples of lecture. Now she tried to say them exactly in the same way. Lecture. 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 But as you can see, even though the last two sounded sort of similar, they are not quite identical. Um, I'm going to put this in a context and... Welcome to the valedictory lecture. This bit... Lecture. I'm going to play it again. Lecture. She sounded a little grumpy in this one. Um, Lecture. Repeated. And this is the context. Please elect your chair. <laughs> That's what you got. 
And all phonologists would recognize that that's precisely what you do. A k, a t, and a y become a ch. This was not manipulated. If you do it yourself by Pratt, I'm sure you can. Now, single word sentences, spoken, written, language, the members of this faculty work on all aspects. We do it all. So although the faculty is comparatively new, linguistics, especially the philological aspects, have been revered in Oxford for a very long time. The first Oxford chair um, of a linguistic nature was the professor of comparative philology, which was in 1868. And the committee of comparative philology, not the committee of comparative philology and linguistics, but the comparative philology, came into existence in the 1920s. The first appointment in linguistics was 70s, and the, chair, the first chair was in 1980. Um, now, linguistics incorporated the was into the system, and the old diploma, which was not an official degree, was then replaced by a regular degree. And in 84, the committee became duly the Committee for Comparative Philology and General Linguistics. A sub-faculty of linguistics was also there. Modern languages had lots of sub-faculties, but this did not really have any authority. That's what I'm told. Now, when the humanities division was really established, the phonetics laboratory was then added to the committee, so it became longer, Committee for Comparative Philology, Linguistics, and Phonetics. And frankly, the most revered, I think, the eminent person who played a role, and sadly not here with us, is Professor Anna Mopuga Davis, the former D board professor of Comparative Philology. Many other eminent scholars, of course, have joined us, and they include Professor Jean Atchison, the Rupert Murdoch professor, the earlier Rupert Murdoch professor, Rebecca Posner, the former professor of the Romance Languages, and Deborah Cameron, the current professor of Murdoch professor, and of course the chairs of linguistics, Professor Roy Harris, James Higginbottom, and Stephen Pullman, who should be here today. Now the current chair joined the committee in 2007, and at my inaugural, the head of the Humanities Division, Professor Sally Shuttleworth, said, I need to make the following announcement. Faculty of Linguistics, Philology, and Phonetics is now a reality. This was August 2008. The new chair also gratefully acknowledged Professor Mopuga Davis, Professor Pullman, Professor Andreas Willey, and Martin Maiden, and particularly the previous chair of the Committee for Linguistics and Philology, Dr. John Coleman. This was the faculty we began with. And there were many of us from very distant faculties coming together. It was truly vibrant. After retirements, um, no, sorry, first Mass Husband, a new, new faculty position was created. And then after retirements, we had further additions. And then for career moves, etc., more people joined us. And new professors came in as well got attached to the faculty, and then many departmental lecturers have also joined us. So it is really a vibrant faculty. Now, the current chair's linguistic interests are, well, phonology, obviously, patterns of sounds, how they interact with each other, how they change, why they change, why they do not change by tenacity, and how they are processed in the brain. So, if you are, as you saw in elect your to lecture, shapes of words change in particular contexts. For the phonologist, it's important to think of not sounds, think of sounds, but not letters. So it's typical for us to consider the international phonetic alphabet, which is one sound, one letter. Now, English is particularly bad, right? So if you have a bunch of letters like C, S, G, or T, H, the, the corresponding sound, phoneme, is the C can be K and S, S can be S and Z, and so on. And the other way around, one phoneme, many letters, that's also equally possible. So you have a J, huge, or badge. So the English is a language which has spelling bees. No other language, to my knowledge, does. And you know, it's just a um, pronunciation. It, it, is, it, is it is a pain. But Bengali is no better, frankly. So, I mean, 
you have the same letter, different vowel. This is, a, there are many Bengalis in the audience, therefore they will recognize this. So ka, this is, this is a, the, the sequence of letters, like camera. And then you have keli, which is exactly the same, but pronounced differently, like k. Um, a different letter, same vowel. Again, the same thing. We have a short e and a long e in writing, but of course we don't say them. But if you try to convince a native speaker that, no, 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 these sounds are really the same, they won't believe you, but they are. So now let's take a co contrast between two consonants, sir and z. So if you're, this, the orthography here, sip and zip, this is very, very this, this is transparent. Okay, fine. However, when you take the plural, um, caps and cabs, bets, beds, docks, dogs, they are not. So the, the, the letter S is actually not pronounced exactly like a sir, but it could be sir or the. There are more plural formations. So for example, the kneel, knee, pale, cane, or lamb. And there, the sounds with the E followed by vowel followed by a z, l followed by a z, etc., which is basically the vowels l, m, n are followed by a z. So essentially what's happening is that this is completely predictable in English, uh, irrespective of how the plural suffix is written, the pronunciation depends on the features of the final sound of the noun. So what are features? Well, according to the work we've been doing for many years, um, we believe that these are the finite number of features you require to combine them to make all the sounds of the world. There were the two interesting ones at the moment are voice and strident. And let's forget the others for a second um, and take a look, go back to the plural. So what we have is, if you take the phonological features of the sounds we were concerned with, berda, ga, la, ma, the common factor is that the plural, the marker is actually, they have one thing in common, it's a zer or a sir, and that is a strident sound, it's a hissing sound. And what is important is that they must match in voice. So if you have a noun ending in a perta a voiceless sound, you match, you add a sir. If it's a voiced sound, you add a sir. So it's actually a very simple rule, but if you think of it in terms of letters, it isn't. It seems like completely ad hoc. Yeah. Now, um, this is not at all uncommon that in context, sounds change. So perta cur, for example, for English or German native speakers, you would aspirate them. If you hold it in your front, your hand in front of you and say per, you will see some air. Yeah. That is not true for French, uh, Dutch, or any of the Romance languages. Um, so pin or supper, but not in a cluster, it would be prosper, it wouldn't be prosper. Okay. Um, what, the other thing that happens is that in a context, the pronunciation changes. It may not necessarily change in writing, of course. So, for instance, if you have handbag or handkerchief, handkerchief actually was, used to be written like that, the kerchief, um, and it's pronounced handkerchief. There is no, no letter to represent a vela nasal. In Bengali, you have one, but the ng, but in English, you don't, but it is, that's the way you pronounce it. Um, and another point is that they are largely, this sort of process is asymmetric. So you get from ner to ber, ma, but not mer to. So Amtrak does not become Antrak, but rainbow will become rainbow. It is variable, but nevertheless, it happens all the time. A native speaker will not say rainbow. Yeah. Um, now, this again, this asymmetry and assimilation happens all the time. In Sanskrit, you can from Chandra to Chad, but it doesn't go the other way around. You have in Germanic languages, many German speakers here, you have a U becomes U in the context of E, but the U never reverts back. Old English also had it, and it became unrounded, but never reverted back. Um, in German, in the writing system, sometimes reflects this. So ent phalen became emp phalen. You write emp phalen. You don't even realize that that was ent before. Now, let me give you an example from Middle English. This is manuscripts from Chaucer. Um, 
and you will see that this particular pre uh, prefix in um, has many phonological shapes. So for instance, you will have immoral, impossible, imbalance, or but innumerable, intolerant, etc., or in incongruent. You don't write it, but you'd, that's the way it would be said, or illegal and irregular. Now, these, this particular prefix is not a Germanic one. It did not, it was not inherited. It was borrowed from the Romance languages, Latin or Old French. But what you find is that you f find a variation in orthography showing that this was not always the case. So take this, the tale of Melody. This is not a poem, this was a text. It can be a poem in other languages, like Dutch, for instance. Um, but you will see over here that this is a nice, clear M. Yeah. But if you look at the same, man, um, same story, but in a different manuscript, this time in Wales, and a different scribe, apparently, so you're here, you'll see it's a clear N. Yeah. So obviously, the scribes must have heard it as a ma, and so you were less prescriptive in your writing systems. The perception from me led to a change in the orthography. Yeah. Now, words like input, I-N-P-U-T, are also pronounced input, but the, the spelling hasn't changed, and probably because we are more prescriptive, it will not change, but that's the way you say it. Okay. Now, from a phonology's perspective, you tend to think of a production. So you have a representation in the mental lexicon, you have a bunch of rules, like the plural one I showed you, then you have an output. The question is, what about comprehension? What are the units of representation? We say a lot about that. But what are the units that are extracted from the signal? We don't say much. And how do they match up? What is the matching procedure? We say even less. So I'm going to claim that the asymmetry in synchronic and diachronic systems is plausible that the asymmetry is an inherent part of the system and that language processing change, that does not happen in a void. It just doesn't happen it is through grammars being acquired, used, and adjusted by humans. So it is a talk not on just on languages as behavior, but on grammars of languages as represented in the mind and brain. And I would like to also claim the entire system is right. Change is severely constrained. We do not like change. Now, how do native speakers cope with the variation here? Yeah. So one possible strategy is to keep the sen contrast sensitivity asymmetric. If things are asymmetric, if your apples are green and red, it's, it's easier to find them. If they are gradations of the same, they are very difficult to distinguish. So we, we argue that considering the noise in the system, asymmetries help to detect a contrast and therefore under specification of sound features. So what do I mean by that? So let's take an example for coronal, which is one of the places of articulation. And the claim is that it is always underspecified. What do I mean by that? But before talking about that, let me give you an example of why all features are not present in all languages. So let's take a language A and a lang another language B. The, uh, the difference between them is one particular phoneme, one sound. But let's take compare between sir and sure. They have to be distinguished, and you use the feature low. Otherwise, it wouldn't be necessary for that feature. If you add another consonant, like this one, t, then you need to do something further. Before, in language A, the s was marked as a low, the t did not need to be marked because there was no other competition. Now that you have a competition, you need that feature to be extended. Okay. So the same thing will happen in vowels. Let's take a vowel u, which is in French, you find it, or German while in English you don't, and you don't really need to distinguish labial feature over there. They are distinguished by other features. But in language B, you need to do that, and you need to specify all the labial vowels. So it is a question of what the competition is within the language and how many features you require. However, the coronal asymmetry is available for everyone. So if it is true that this is asymmetric, then what are the hypotheses considering under specified representations? 
So let's take green sonnet and number, word final, word initial, word medial. The argument is that it is not contextual, it's unspecified everywhere. And words like cream, image, and measure, they are specified for labial. They're always specified. So the asymmetry is that NA does not have a specification. It will be extracted from the signal. Of course it is, because you speak it, but it is not in the representation. And what does that mean? That means that the, what, what, do I, what does the listener have to do? The listener has to listen to the relevant units. The, the speaker is speaking. The listener has no control over the speaker. So you just have to make do with listening to what you've been told. And then they match these units to the stored representation and you recognize words. So what is the relevant information that should be represented? All variants, and this is what the automatic speech recognition systems do. Uh, they try to represent everything in a huge cloud and then sort of with means of statistics try to get to the right one. But that's not the way the human brain works. So do you need some abstractions? Yes. Question is how much? And the answer is quite a lot. So the perceptual system analyzes the signal. It then matches it to the representation. There is no intermediate representation. You let the lexicon do the work. You have a list of words. Why not do the work? So for children, their lexicons will be smaller. So their, naturally, their matching process will be the same, but the lexicon size will be different. So the three-way matching process is match, mismatch, and this. That is to say, I agree with you, I do not like you, go away, and no mismatch. So when you listen to the phone and you're trying to give your name, and they don't understand at the other side, so you say A for alpha, B for beta, or whatever, that's because the certain sounds are harder to understand than others. And the notion over here is that indeed those that are underspecified are easier. Those that are specified, you will be able to throw them out. So um, in the model over here, it would say that if I have mispronounced or misheard, uh, which happens all the time, if green is misheard as green, then it will, not, it will still be tolerated. It will still be accepted as a version of green. But that's not true if the word green is heard as green. So the asymmetry is that a mispronounced word or misheard word will be still accepted, but in, t in terms of the m sound, it will not. It doesn't matter what word it is. So these are just examples. So when you go to the lab, you need to find the, you know, the, you have to control for everything, find a subset of words that are equally frequent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then uh, put, putting it very simply, this is what you basically find. So the task was very simple. It was your spoken word presented before the target. And you have to say, yes, this is a word or not. It's a favorite task of psycholinguistics. So you hear this, let's say the left-hand side, people hear sonnet, the right hand heard summit, and both of you see poem. And you have to say, yes, poem is a word, as fast as possible. And then there is an unrelated word, computer. So the, the notion is that both words are in your lexicon. So if you hear sonnet, poem will be activated, so you are jolly fast. The question we want to know is when you hear a mispronounced word, is it going to activate it or not? And the, th the, the idea being that, yes, when sonnet terms to summit, it will activate it. Now, since I'm showing you this, obviously it did work. Otherwise, I wouldn't be showing you this. And this is the hypothesis. Sonnet to summit will work. Image to image will not work. It should, it should not give you any activation. Okay. So the English medial consonants, they show definite priming effects. So sonnet and the mispronounced summit activate poem but image and image do not. Image activates picture, image does not. And that means this is just an example. All the words together statistically show this. Now the question is, what does the brain do? Now if you measure the electrical activity of the brain, it's very, 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 very tiny, and you have to get lots of data to make it work. Um, and one of the things that in the 80s um, was discovered was what was called a particular component of the brain was N400. Now, this one said, this is a component which I call it the oops effect. So let's give you an example. So if you hear pizza and eat, 
the brain is perfectly calm because, yes, you eat pizzas, but you do not drink pizzas. So when you hear pizza drink, it gets a, like, what is that? So it, is, it does not, um, lexical integration fails, basically, and that is what you get the N400. And that's the, that's the idea. So let's see if sonnet will activate poem, I should get a low N400. But if it doesn't activate poem, I should get a high N400. It's very, very simple. It's actually very crude, these, uh, but that's all we have. Um, and that's indeed what you get. You find that there is very low activation. This alone is not going to tell you anything. It's always a comparative. Um, so once I put the other one to image, to, so if I change image to image, I get a very high end. So it simply doesn't activate it, and the other one does. Yeah. So if what happens when you have vowels? Do they do the same thing? And in this example I'm giving you, it's a combination of morphological contrast and phonological asymmetry. So I'm using words for vowel height. This was place, now it's a question of height. We have high and low vowels. So the examples we choose were, were sit, the ablaut verbs, the verbs which are the old verbs of Indo-European. You have sit, sad, get, got, and then you made non-words by simply changing the final consonant. So the acoustics were kept the same. Okay. And what is the difference? Well, sit and sat have two vowels at two extremes in height, and they would mismatch. While get and got should not, they should be asymmetric. One happens to be coronal, one is dorsal. So you're expecting an asymmetry. This time, it is also an uh, EEG experiment, but now we are looking for a mismatch negativity, which means it's the sort of thing which we used to do when we were uh, graduate students ourselves, and it is an automatic change detection response. Uh, the participant is looking at a lovely movie, not a movie which may make you laugh or cry, because that would be disastrous. So sort of things like dolphins or something, you know, something innocuous. Um, and they are hearing the sounds and the brain is active behind the back. So you're tapping the underlying phonological representation. And when you're getting, so let's say you get ba, 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 da, ba, ba, etc. We used to do this with poor babies in the sucking technique. Luckily, they are not allowed to do this now anymore. You had a little sucker, they heard ba, 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 and then a da, and the baby either cried or stopped or went to sleep. But from that, you sort of deduced whether these sounds had an effect or not. But this is like, again, the sort of oops effect. If you hear, if the sound does not conflict with the other one that you've been hearing, you would get a low MMN, otherwise you get a high one. Yeah. So essentially you hear, you get sit to sat or sat to sit, or and you get the non-words. So first question is, do the words and non-words differ? They shouldn't because the vowel representation is the same. It is accidentally a non-word because this simply doesn't happen to have be there in the lexicon, but it could easily be a word. So what you've read is this. So first, the vowel height asymmetry, high and low. And indeed, you find that there is no significant difference in the MMN. They are literally on top of each other, both for sit, sat, and sif, sa. However, when you get get got or get off, you get an asymmetry, which is quite clear. So vowels and consonants in terms of features behave the same way. So English vowels exhibit the asymmetry in processing just like consonants. We did the same with the mandolins, uh, Mandarin sibilants as well. Mandarin has one sibilant consonant, the sir. Um, however, it has a sh as well, but since you have one is specified, the other does not need to be specified in terms of its height. However, if it's not specified, it will take on the features of the neighboring vowel much more easily. Yeah. And that is, so if it's a sure sound, it's not specified for its height, then it's going to get the height from the preceding, the, from the following vowel. Question is, does this give us the asymmetry we would normally predict? The hypothesis is that we would. Let's see if it does. And just to give you uh, the surface forms to show you again very clearly that the s a spreads the low, u spreads the high, 
and thereby we should get this following prediction. So if you have low to low, then you would expect this to be a no mismatch, it should be tolerated. If you get a high spreading, then you would get a lack of, you get an asymmetry because one direction will be a clash and the other direction will be tolerance. And that's essentially what you get. Yeah. So these are just the oscillograms and the spectrograms to show you that they were real stimuli, real sounds not um, made up. Um, and the results are the following. You get the strident figures show an asymmetry depending on context. The low vowel, the do not mismatch, neither in the MMN nor in the late discriminative negativity. There's no significant difference. They're top of each other. However, for the U vowel, U to, we would expect a mismatch, and there indeed you get a significant difference between the two. Now let's move to a quantity. We have features, we also have quantity. Now, short and long vowels in English is typical. You don't, of course, write them as short and long, but ship and sheep and sick and sick. There is a qualitative difference as well, but there is definitely a quantity difference. Old English had short and long, but it also had short and long consonants. So you had metan, etan, they were short vowels, short consonants, gretan and setan, there was a long consonant. Of course, language doesn't stay constant and old English to modern English, you get first and lengthening of open syllables. Actually, not just in English, you got it in Dutch and German, um, all over the place. Um, and in modern English, you have the long vowel remains long, doesn't do anything, but the short vowel metan becomes to meet, meet out. And the consonants, of course, the etan also became long, eat, but the consonants, short consonants, they stay short, but the long consonants, the gem, geminates, became short, setan became set. And that is again true for all the Germanic languages. Um, in fact, the word bedel in Old English was budel or bidel, which again became long to budel, but then English decided to reborrow it from the Romance languages, and now it's become bidel. Um, if, it if it kept it, it would have had a long vowel and a stress in the initial position. Now, short and long consonants in Bengali has the long consonants. So you have kana, kanna, or pata, pata. Now, open syllable lengthening occurred everywhere. How do we know that it actually did occur? I mean, other than the fact that you compare it to different stages. Well, just a small example from a manuscript. <clears throat> so closed syllables are consistent. And primitive, this is, we are looking at proto-Germanic vowels, and we know they were written with one. If they were closed syllables, they were short vowels are written with one, long vowels are written with two. And in open syllables, you expect a variation, if there is open syllable lengthening. But when open syllable lengthening was uncertain, then you get, you don't know what you're doing. If it's completely predictable, then you put a single vowel and you're fine. Yeah. So I'm going to look at the ma manuscripts. Some these, are, these are 14th century manuscripts um, in the Bodleian, um, and we had great fun looking at them. Um, not all manuscripts are easily accessible. These were, thank goodness, because they were happened to be here. Uh, and what you find, so if it's a long vowel, proto-Germanic, then you write it with two, two, graph, two graphemes in Saladin, and that's essentially what you find, if it can be seen, yeah. Um, but long vowels are predictable and thus consistently written with one grapheme, and indeed, again, you find it with one, and they rhyme as well, okay. <clears throat> in Luthkart, where evidence of OSL had not quite occurred, there is, <coughs> excuse me, there is variation. So sometimes it's written with an OE and sometimes with a single vowel. Their open syllable lengthening had not fully occurred. 
You can also find evidence by looking at rhymes, whether they are rhyming or not. And in Saladin, you see a clear lining, the long vowel. If an original long vowel is rhyming with the original short vowel, then you know open syllable lengthening has taken place. And indeed, that's what you get, dade and skade. Now, OSL and loss of long consonants have had a devastating effect on the phonological systems, and which in turn, of course, affect the way we borrow the words in other languages. So take, let's take a look at what language processing short versus long did first. So this is an example from Bengali. I'll just play them to show you that they are really long. I hope they play. Anna, yeah. Anna, pata, pata. Yeah. So they are long consonants. Even if it is a silence with the third sound, it is actually heard as long. Okay. Italian will have it too, but Italian, the long and short are also um, sort of in complementary distribution to the length of the vowel. Here, the vowel remains the same, just the consonant is long. Do we have the same asymmetry in processing? Yes, indeed, we do. So the hypothesis is that if indeed it is a single consonant, then it is unspecified. If it's a long consonant, it has a mora. And you would expect, again, an asymmetry. That is to say, if something is lengthened, you may be accepted short to long, OK, long to short, no way. Yeah. And that's essentially what you find. Short to long, there is the same amount of facilitation. Long to short, no. The long one's primed, the, long, the shortened version does not. And you can think about it. I think that makes, that makes quite good sense. Yeah. And in fact, if you see it in the ERPs, you find exactly the same. Short to long, one on top of each other. Long to short, no way. There's an asymmetry. Okay. So quantity behaves the same way as other features. Now, a rule of pattern may persist over a long time. I've argued about this. But you can have the same pattern for a long time, but the output can change. And you may not realize that the output, the, the, and then eventually the pattern might change too. But that is where the hidden phonology comes in. But how does pertinacity affect loan adaptation? Now, English, like all other languages, when you're coming into contact with other languages, you're going to borrow words. Yeah. So take this lovely gentleman over here. Of course, you recognize who it is. And the pronunciation of this person in German is van Gogh. English, depending whether you're American or British, you have either van Gogh or you have van Gogh. And the original in Dutch, and there are Dutch native speakers here, plenty of them here, van Gogh. Right. Okay. So it is adapted in the language according to what your own phonology happens to be. And it's also true for the dialect differences. So German, Austrian, and Hanover is mathematik versus mathematik. Or in English, mathematics, and in Indian English, it would be mathematics. And this wonderful mountain, very close to where I was born, is pronounced in German. And let's see if I get it right. Himalaya and Darjeeling. English, I think, is similar. Himalayas and Darjeeling. This is now looking at the stress pattern. In my own language, it would be Himalaya, Darjeeling. So, it is almost impossible for an English native speaker to say Darjeeling, not for the T or for anything else. <laughs> so Germanic to Latinate stress. Of course, William the Conqueror came with loads and loads of people who decided to stay on. 200 years, the king of England, the royalty, didn't speak any English. Lots of intermarriages, words got incorporated. Of course, the language is going to have an effect. English, Old English, was very strictly left stress. You had a left foot, you stressed the left edge, and that's all there was to it. You had another foot somewhere else, but it didn't really matter. As soon as words started coming in, in Chaucer, you see different pronunciations all over the place, but still it was kind of, let's stick to the left edge. 
comparable residence, the early borrowings. Now, you, you can see, if you look at the OED, you will find, and Philip Durkin is here who will tell us, that most of the time we first borrow the noun, that makes sense. So if you have words like sane sanity, it's the sanity which came first and then sane. So the relationship was probably established later. And initially, most of the words were left edge. Later borrowings sort of went towards the right edge a bit, and you had words like severity, rarity. English orthopists, they love to tell you how to pronounce language. And it's usually about 50 years behind the times because people naturally prefer the, what was preceding or their grandparents did. So there are loads and loads of books all over the place telling you how exactly, which is very good for linguists, of course, because we know. Um, so since 1600, um, Elon Brescia and I have worked on this forever and ever. It seemed to us that it did not change for a very long time. It's only after post-Shakespeare that you see the actual foot structure change. And now, silent changes in English, which is the problem. And one of those is the open syllable lengthening. You lengthened the vowels and made them heavy. Then you shortened the consonants and you made them light. And then they were all over the place. And then on top of it, there came these borrowed verbs with first syllable unstressed. And you got nice pairs like the, they used to exist, begin and forbid. But now you got plenty more like torment, torment, present, present, permit, permit, etc. This is a bane for non-native speakers. Handful of suffixes with long vowels were introduced, but the core grammar just simply remained as it was. What evidence do we have that the metrical system of a native speaker has a say in the processing of a second language? So it is, English has become pretty much the language for everybody to speak and to learn. And there are many fluent native speakers of English. But they also have to contend with their own language. And what I'm talking about now are non-native, so if it is a Germanic word and a Germanic language, you stress the initial syllable. There are no two ways about it. But if it's a Romance word, that's not what you do. The question is, how do German native speakers, fluent speakers of English, react to English words which have been borrowed from Romance languages? So I'll just give you a handful. For German native speakers, you might find this very surprising that you can have Whereas a certain words German did not borrow, like curfew, pigeon, mushroom, etc. Some they did, but initial stress in English, pirate, agent, organ, by pirate, agent, organ, and sometimes with two feet, costume, insect, impulse, costume, insect, impulse, or final stress. And German has trisyllabic, while English has disyllabic, method, choral, melon, legend, melona, legenda, metoda, etc. Again, the question is not how English process it, but how German native speakers speaking fluent English, how do they process these words? Does their native language have an effect? Well, if their phonology is playing a role, it would. So this is the prime and target is a fragment. They get only a fragment they hear. So something like con, and they would hear contract, see contract, and they have to press the button and say it's a real word or not. Very simple experiment. So if you hear were first, first syllable stressed, do you activate the word or not? And does it matter whether your language is going to have a conflict? I would think yes. So what you find is the following. So what you get is that if words did not exist in the, the comparable words did not exist in the language, they got a much better priming effect. So there was no corresponding loans in their own language. German native speakers accessed the English words very much more successfully. And in fact, when you looked closely, it looks as if it is the when there is one single foot, which is I, not ideal for Germans, like pigeon, these are the words which cause the big difference. And if you look at the brain waves then more carefully, then you find essentially the same pattern. So exists in German. You get a low N400, doesn't exist in German, a high N400. This is quite different from what others people have been saying, but this is very systematic. 
And if you look at it again, break it up, you find that the, the driving force, again, are the words with one foot. So the phonologists in the audience will appreciate this, that you say this is no difference at all, but when you have words like pigeon, you find a difference. Okay. So finally, we come to um, actually a, a connected speech. How do words group together? How do we plan our utterances? Well, this was a slogan, very common one, which was drink a pint of milk a day. So the syntax is, of course, very different. Drink a pint of milk a day, which is just drink a pint of milk a day, right? So what happens is the function words are attaching to the main word to the left. Question, how do we process these? The idea being, so Henry Sweet, Oxford, of course, uh, late 1800s was teaching English to Germans and saying, no, you don't pronounce like the old computers, one, you know, separate words. In normal speech, you group things together. How? So in, this is one of the sentences he uses, and he gives it in his rope transcription. So something like, used to think the is one item, was a kind of one item with the kind of one item, etc. He also did Chaucer's uh, in his own transcription, and you will see something like, you know, with is, these are grouped together again, when that, with is, together. So whenever there's a function word, you try to attach it to leftwards. Um, and if you don't believe me, let me play this for you again. I wish summer would come soon. Uh, so, yeah, I wish summer would come oh. soon. Played it back again, so that another summer. I'm telling you, summer back. And this is what, this was Kate Dobson, and that's essentially what you get. Yeah. So this again comes very much. It is that's the way we speak. Yeah. Now, in Germanic, enclitization is preferred all over the place, um, and you find this things like want to, have to, cannot have become single words. Um, fish and chips is fish and chips. You now find it even in writing. German inflected determiners do this all the time. In das is ins. It's only non-native speakers like me who say it fully, which is incorrect actually. Um, in dame um, and so on. Now, the dental preterite, which is one of the biggest things that uh, has happened in the history of Germanic in all the Germanic languages. The old verbs were sing, sang. You changed the vowel to make the past tense. But then you made now verbs out of uh, nouns, like kiss. So you made a verb out of kiss. But how would you make a past tense then? The only way to do that was to add a past tense of a verb to do. So kiss became kiss, kissed, became kiss, did, and then became kissed. And this has happened to all the Germanic languages. It's either a D or a T, depending on what the language has. Now, um, it's pan-Germanic suffix, basically. Let's give you a brief idea of the experimental evidence for this. So far as our work has concerned, we have argued that the latency, the time it takes you to prepare, you don't start speaking immediately. One has to think about what to speak. Of course, it's cultural, right? So if you have Swiss native speakers, they will take three seconds. If you have Bengali native speakers, they don't stop. They just interrupt. <laughs> Italians do the same. So it really is, d depends. Now, but we do need to plan. How much do we have to plan? And does it matter what the size of the unit that we are planning? Yes, it does. So earlier work has shown it's the size of the first prosodic phonological unit that matters, not the syntactic unit. So let's just take compounds for the moment. Vitals, of course, is a, it's a two phonological words. And then there is, um, you can make a compound out of it or a phrase out of it. If it's a compound, it's white house. If it's a phrase, it's white house. Um, how do we plan the words in a normal utterance? So I'm going to, oh, come on. Yeah, OK. Let's take uh, these words, dish cloth, damp cloth. They're terrible words, aren't they? But there were lots of others. Um, so if you have a compound, it's two prosodic, two syllables. Uh, but one prosodic unit. Now, if you had an adjective phrase, it's two 
of course, two syllables, but the first unit has one. If you have a disyllabic word, it's, of course, two. What happens when you attach a function word? What, do you, what happens when you say dishcloths are clean? Well, dishcloths are becomes one unit. That means it's three syllables. But if you have an adjective phrase like dry cloths, then the cloths is getting the R, but not the dry. The dry is sitting there happily without changing. That's this one syllable. It remains as it is. And dolphins are becoming, becoming long as well. So the first evidence comes from, so when you see something, you hear what, you don't read this, you're constructing a sentence. All you see is the, the compound or the adjective phrase, and you hear a question, what was it, and then you say it. And what we find, we expect to find, is that the first prosodic words, if it's one syllable, it'll be shorter. So a single word and an adjective phrase will be the shortest, and the others will be the same. It's quite counterintuitive. And indeed, that's what we find. Yeah. We find that the adjective phrase and the monosyllabic word are basically the same. If we add a clitic now, the question changes, what are clean now? And then we expect something different. We are expecting the adjective phrase to be the fastest because the first word is the shortest. And indeed, that's what we get. So we find that if we have the adjective phrase that is the shortest, the fastest, and the monosyllabic word is actually more because it is attaching the clitic. It has two syllables now. While the adjective phrase hasn't changed because it did not take the clitic. The noun took the clitic. So if we compare them together, this becomes much clearer. You will see that in, without the clitic condition, the adjective phrase and the monosyllabic word were identical. With the clitic condition, the adjective phrase was the fastest. Again, extremely counterintuitive, but very effective. So the phonological weak words attach left words and essentially become suffixes or single words in due course, as we have seen for the past tense. Finally, we have a thing about zero derivation. English loves to do this. Um, if you have a word like I, it can be a noun or it can be a verb. I used to think that desk was just a noun, it couldn't be a verb. Then I was told, oh no, you get hot desk. So to hot desk something would be a verb. So one can make a verb almost out of anything. Certain things not though. So if you have, but the suffix in can only attach to verbs. So if eyeing or singing, eyeing is two steps. You go from an I to I and eyeing and then singing is just singing. The question is, do native English speakers care about the level of the complexity? Do you really, when you're accessing eyeing, are you going to really care how the depth of the derivation? So this time, and the, very rarely do we do fMRIs because it's difficult to get access to machines like this. But with colleagues, we did this in Birmingham. And we find that indeed it was, had an effect. So the base was evaluated, hundreds of words were chosen, you compared the concreteness, imageability, etc., etc. Let's just get to the results. We're looking at the blood flow. And this is the blood flow of a two steps, just of the difference with the overlapping activity for both types of complex words as against the non-complex word. So the, yes, the brain is, cares about complexity. The brain does care about complexity. But that's not what we're really interested in. The question is, is there a difference? And indeed, there is a difference. So here you see the red activity is the, for the two-step, and the blue bit is the activity of eyeing over singing one step. So we do see a difference in the de degree of activation based on derivational depth. Thus, the brain is sensitive to the depth of complexity. 
In sum, words and word structures vary. They are replete with asymmetries. What appears on the surface is not necessarily isomorphic to what is stored. Phonological representations are abstract, discrete, not fully specified and exploit asymmetries. Asymmetry in representation is reflected in processing. And the native speaker's grammar pertinaciously constrains the way in which contrasts are maintained, accessed in processing, which may reflect the reanalysis in future. These are all the colleagues who have really done all the work with lots of acknowledgements to so many grants that we have been fortunate to get and receive. And many, many of them are here. However, I mustn't forget my past DPhils who taught me so much. They have gone on to do many different things in many different parts of the world. So there are quite a few of them. Some of them are here. And of course, the current DPhils. I have not put their titles up here because you never know, they might change when they are finishing. And they will be finishing quite soon. And I'm going to end with another non-isomorphic. You heard this before, but it still is not isomorphic. And this time is slightly different. I'm going to, what we have to do when this chair leaves is. Please elect your chair. Indeed. That's the elect bit. And guess what? You also get an elect from the valedictory lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to stay here? I want to stay you could here. Stay here. Yes. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, I hope that was a correct lect there. Um, before I'd met Oddity, before she came to Oxford, I thought of her in connection with parsimonious phonological analysis. I associated her mainly with the work that you did together with Bruce Hayes in the 90s on Bengali international phonology, because that was what we were all reading, even if we weren't going to be theoretical phonologists. And that opened my eyes to what a, a parsimonious analysis looks like, how you can get things that seem very complicated from just a small number of simple principles. And this lecture reminded me of reading that work back then. I think you've reminded us of that on several different levels, the feature of the underspecified lexicon, pertinacity, but also bringing experimental evidence to bear. Why do we believe that these things are really true, in part because of your work in the Language and Brain Lab? But I wanted to thank you not only for the lecture, but on behalf of the faculty and on behalf of all of us for everything you've done for linguistics, your scholarship, your strong support of us personally and as linguists and of the subject, the only word that really comes to mind is pertinacity here, um, and also for your personal kindness. And on behalf of the faculty and all of us, our student reps and our postdoc rep have a small token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. I won't open this now. I shall open it later. But uh, the, the whole, I, this was not supposed to be a, a present giving or a <laughs> saying words. It was supposed to be just a quiet lecture and then go and have a drink. Shall we go have a drink? <laughs> I think there is some snacks to drink and some wine to eat in a minute outside. <laughs> shall we?